look at some examples of optimization problems. In each of these problems, we're going to follow the guidelines that were outlined in the last video uh, when we introduced optimization. So let's look at the first problem. Number one, the farmer has 2,400 feet of fencing and wants to fence off a rectangular field that borders a straight river. So let's start by drawing a diagram. So we have the rectangular field. Let me draw in the river. The river doesn't need any fences on it, so the part that gets fenced is just the other three sides. The question part of the question, what are the dimensions of the field that have largest area? So our goal is to maximize area. So let's write a function for area. In order to do that, we need to label some variables on our diagram. So I'm going to give some dimensions on this rectangle. I'll just label one side as x and another side as y. So then our area is x times y. And now we have an area function. Now this function has two variables, x and y, so we can't do any derivatives or anything like that with it just yet. What we need to do is get rid of a variable, and in order to do that, we need a constraint equation. So our constraint is the length of fencing that we have available. If we add up the length of the fence based on our dimensions, we have a length x, a length y, and another length x. So our length of fencing is x plus y plus x, and that has to equal a total of 2,400. So we have 2x plus y equals 2,400. We can pick which variable we want to solve for. I'm going to keep things easy and solve for y by subtracting 2x on both sides. So we get y equals 2,400 minus 2x. We can then take that and plug it into y in our objective function in order to eliminate the variable y. Now we simplify a little bit. In this case, all we had to do was distribute the x. So we have area is 2,400x minus 2x squared. This is now a function of just one variable. You can write area as a function of just x, so we can differentiate. So the derivative is a prime equals 2,400 minus 4x. To find the critical points, we want to solve a prime equals 0, and we want to find where a prime is undefined. Solving a prime equals 0, we get 2,400 minus 4x equals 0. We subtract to get negative 4x equals negative 2,400, and divide to get x equals 600. Since this is a polynomial, there's nowhere where x is undefined. So our only critical point occurs when x is 600. That means that that's going to be dimensions that maximize our area function. Since we have an x value, and we want both dimensions, we need to find y. So we'll go ahead and plug into our y equation. So y equals 2,400 minus 2 times x. And we solved to find x was 600. So we find y is 2,400 minus 1,200, or just 1,200. We should be careful to include our units, since we were measuring in feet. y is 1,200 feet. x is 600 feet. Those are the dimensions that will give us the field of largest area. This question didn't ask us to actually find that largest area, but we could have found that by just plugging into our area function. Okay, moving on to the next problem. A cylindrical can is to be made to hold one liter of oil. So my diagram is going to be a cylinder. Since it's made to hold one liter of oil, and that's a volume, I'll go ahead and write down what volume of a cylinder is. Volume is pi r squared h. So when I draw my diagram, I want to have the radius r and the height h labeled. We want to find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the metal to manufacture the can. So what we want to do is minimize surface area. So our goal is to minimize surface area. So we should write a function for surface area. In order to find surface area, what we need to do is to break down this can into different pieces. So we can say, all right, there is the surface area at the top, the area of the bottom, and the area of the sides. Really only one side, it's just, you know, it goes all the way around. So the top of the can is a circle with radius r, so its area is pi r squared. Same thing with the bottom. The side of the can, if I were to imagine taking that cylinder and unrolling it, it would unroll into a rectangle where the height of the rectangle is the height of the cylinder, and the width of the rectangle would be the circumference of the cylinder. 
So the area of that rectangle is going to be height times circumference. Circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. So the area of the sides of the can is 2 pi r h. Combining like terms, pi r squared plus pi r squared gives me 2 pi r squared. This is the function that we want to minimize, so we need to get it down to just one variable, and currently it has two variables. So let's go find a constraint. We were told that the can is made to hold one liter of oil, so our constraint is going to be that the volume is 1, okay, measured in liters. Now, we didn't give units to anything else. It turns out that 1 liter is exactly equal to 1 cubic decimeter. If we make all of our lengths decimeters, then we could just say, all right, the volume is 1. Our function for volume is pi r squared h. So 1 equals pi r squared h. And we have to decide now what variable we want to solve for. We have a couple of things to look at. When I go to plug in, if I plug in a value for r, I have to plug into two places. If I go to plug in for h, I only have to plug in one spot. The other thing that we can look at is solving for r versus solving for h. To solve for h, I divide once, and I'm done. To solve for r, I first have to divide, and then to get rid of the squared, I have to square root, which means I'm going to have a square root in the problem, which I probably don't want if I can avoid it. So we're going to solve for h. So 1 over pi r squared equals h. So plugging that in, we've replaced the h with a 1 over pi r squared. Let's do some simplifying. The pi and the numerator and denominator cancel, as do one of the r's. So we're left with 2 pi r squared plus 2 r to the negative 1 power, if I convert this to an exponent instead of a fraction. Now we're ready to differentiate. So my surface area prime is going to equal 2 pi is a constant, so it hangs out. Derivative of r squared is 2r. The derivative of r to the negative 1 is negative 1r to the negative 2, using the power rule. Now that I'm done differentiating, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Group like terms, so we have 4 pi r. And on the other side, I'm going to rewrite this as a fraction again. This makes it easier to solve, and it also makes it a lot easier to find out where the derivative is undefined. So derivative equal to 0. That's where we get some of our critical points. So 4 pi r minus 2 over r squared is equal to 0. To solve this, I'm going to multiply through by r squared. So we'll have 4 pi r cubed. And when I multiply by neg uh, negative 2 over r squared, the r squareds cancel, and we just get minus 2. So now to solve, we'll add 2 to both sides. divide, and then cube root. So we have the cube root of 1 over 2 pi. As a decimal, this is approximately 0 0.5419. Remember, our units are decimeters. If you didn't look up units in this one, I think that that, that would be OK. In a physics class, that would be unexcusable. But, but here, the units weren't given to begin with. So if you just left them off, we'd be fine. We also have to double check and look for where the, where the derivative of surface area is undefined. And we do indeed have a value, because I have a fraction here. So when r squared is equal to 0, so r is equal to 0, we get another critical point. Now, if I look back at my original diagram, when r is 0, we don't have a can. So this doesn't represent a solution. And since we only have one legitimate critical point, that must be the dimension that will minimize the can. We do need to find the h, though. So I'm going to go back to my h equals equation to find a value for h. When I type this in as a decimal, I get 1.0839. That looks to be about double of what r is. And if I was careful and left my answers as exact, I could indeed see that that's the case. 
So let's just go through that really quickly. So rewriting r as a 1 over 2 pi 1 third power, which I can write as 2 pi to the negative third power, I get that h is 1 over pi times 2 pi to the negative 2 thirds, which is 2 pi to the positive 2 thirds over pi, which is 2 to the 2 thirds over pi to the 1 third, which if I multiply numerator and denominator by 2 to the 1 third power, I'll see that I get 2 over 2 to the 1 third times pi to the 1 third, which is 2 times 1 over 2 pi to the 1 third power. So it's exactly double of what r is. The question was find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of metal to manufacture the can. So our dimensions are right here for r and h. Moving on to the next question. Find the point on the parabola y squared equals 2x that is closest to the point 1, 4. So this diagram is going to be a graph. y squared equals 2x is a parabola that opens left, right. And in fact, it opens to the right. It goes through the origin because you can see that 0, 0 is on that graph. The point 1, 4 doesn't lie on the graph. So I can imagine any point on the graph of the parabola is being labeled as x comma y and one of those x y points is going to be closer to the point 1 4 than any other point on the graph and that's what we want to find closest means that we want to minimize distance so if i label my point 1 4 and i have a point on the parabola x comma y my goal is to minimize the distance between the point 1, 4 and x, y on the graph. Now there's two ways to set up this problem. One thing that we could do is to set up our function, which is distance. So I could say that distance, and I use the distance formula, I take the square root of the difference of the x's plus the difference of the y's, and I plug in the two points that I have, so I want x minus 1 squared plus y minus 4 squared. And there's my objective function. It still has two variables, x and y, in it, but I have a function written down now. And another way to think about this function is to imagine, well, if I minimize the square of the distance, that will also happen at the same point that I minimize distance. Okay, so if I think of some numbers, distances, 1 fourth, 2, 8, and I look at their squares, 1 16th, 4, 64. If I look for the smallest distance in the list, it corresponds to the smallest distance squared out of the same set. So instead of minimizing distance, I can call my function that I want to minimize distance squared. You don't have to do that. You can use distance with the square root in there. And the math will mostly work the same. But with distance squared, without the square root, it comes out a little bit uh, more cleanly, a little bit less writing down. Okay, so this is the function that we want to minimize. Okay, so how do we eliminate a variable? Well, I know that x and y lie on the graph, and all points on the graph satisfy this equation, y squared equals 2x. So I know that that's the case. We can then solve that for one of my two variables. So if I divide both sides by 2, 1 half y squared equals x, I can replace my x with a 1 half y squared and eliminate that variable in my objective function. So I replace the x with a 1 half y squared. Now we're ready to differentiate. So f prime of y, using a regular derivative, I still have the chain rule. I could have foiled everything out and avoided a chain rule, but I think a chain rule is fine here. 2 comes down. Inside function stays the same. Lower the power by 1, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Same thing with the second term. 
2 comes down, inside stays the same, we lower the power so it's a power of 1, and then I multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now I take care of my derivatives, the derivative of 1 half y squared is going to be 1 half times 2y, or just y, and the derivative of minus 1 is 0. Likewise, the derivative of y is 1, and the derivative of 4 is 0. So I have a 2, I have a y, I distribute them, and I will get y cubed minus 2y. In the second term, multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything, I distribute the 2, so we get y cubed minus 8. Now let's look for where the derivative is either 0 or undefined. Add 8 to both sides, and then cube root. So I get y is 2. In order to find x, I can plug into my x equation. So we get 2. Don't forget to look for other critical points where f prime is undefined. Since this is a polynomial, I get no solution. So our only critical point is x is 2 and y is 2. That will be the closest point on the parabola to the point 1, 4. Okay, let's look at another problem. Find the area of the largest rectangle that can be inscribed in a semicircle of radius r. So let's draw the diagram and make sure that we go through what all of those words mean. So we have a rectangle, and it's inscribed in a semicircle. That means that I'm going to have half of a circle that goes around it. So we'll draw our half circle to share a side with the rectangle, I think that if we were to try and turn this rectangle so it doesn't share a side, we would have to make it smaller for it to fit. Okay, now obviously my, my diagram isn't a very good drawing because this doesn't look like half of a circle, but that's okay. It's enough to get the idea. Let's go ahead and label our variables. The semicircle has radius r, and I want the dimensions of that rectangle, so I need to label it with some sort of length and width. In order to do any calculus, and this goes back to Rene Descartes, the Cartesian coordinate system, the whole reason that Descartes, or at least the main reason that Descartes used this and is famous for it, is because by putting geometric shapes into a coordinate system, we can then give equations for them and make a connection between geometry and algebra. So rather than solve this as a pure geometry problem, by putting it in a coordinate system, we can introduce some equations and hopefully use some calculus. So what I'm going to do is draw in some coordinate axes through the middle of this. The way that I'm going to take advantage of this is I know how to write the equation of a circle of radius r. x squared plus y squared equals r squared gives me a circle centered at the origin of radius r. Now the rectangle and the circle meet at a point. If I know where that point is, I think that I can find exactly what L and W are, because the y value of that point is exactly equal to L. So if this is the point x, y, then y equals L. And this distance is x, and since I know the circle is perfectly symmetric, the point that I hit over here is going to be the same distance away. So 2x is going to be my width w. So if I want to find the area of my rectangle, that's length times width, which is going to be y times 2x. And now I have a function for area. Now we need to eliminate a variable. We need a constraint equation. And our constraint is going to be since this point x, y is also on the circle, we can use the equation of our circle as our constraint. So I'm going to solve for one of my variables, subtract x squared from both sides. In other problems, we got to make a choice to avoid a square root. Here, both of my choices will end up with a square root, so it doesn't really matter which one you pick. I'm going to plug that into my area function now. So I have y, which is the square root. I'm going to write the 2x in front, though. Before I take a derivative, I'm going to rewrite this square root 
as a one-half power, which is what I like to do before differentiating so that I don't get myself mixed up. I can easily see the power rule. Now we differentiate. So when I differentiate, I have a product of two things. So we need the product rule. So we get the derivative of 2x, which is 2, times that second term left alone, plus 2x left alone, times the derivative of the second term. So I'm going to use the chain rule. The half comes down. The inside function stays the same. Lower the power by 1. And I multiply by the derivative of the inside function. Now, here's where I need to address something that we probably should have talked about a minute ago before we started differentiating. We've been saying all along in this chapter or in this section that we need to have a function of exactly one variable. And I can see an r and an x here. But I'm not thinking of r as being a variable. The dimensions of my rectangle are what are changing. I can play with the length and the width to find the biggest possible rectangle. But I'm inscribing it in a semicircle of radius r. We're thinking of the r as fixed. So I don't know what that r is, but it's a, an unknown constant, not a variable. So if I think of this area as being a function of just my variable x, where r is some unknown constant, I'm differentiating with respect to x. Then when I take the derivative of r, r is a constant. And since it's on its own, its derivative is 0. So I'm just going to recopy down the rest of this problem. I'll rewrite that negative half power as in the denominator. The derivative of r squared is 0. The derivative of negative x squared is negative 2x. So here's our derivative of the area function. Now let's look for where that derivative is 0 and where that derivative is undefined. So starting with the area equals 0, we have 2 square root r squared minus x squared plus negative 2x squared over the square root of r squared minus x squared equals 0. Now I'm going to multiply through by that square root of r squared minus x squared. So when I distribute it to this first term, the square root times the square root will cancel the square roots, and I'll just have the r squared minus x squared. In the second term, it will cancel with the denominator and just give me a 1. And when I multiply it by 0, I'm just going to keep a 0. So that got rid of all of my square roots. Let's distribute 2r squared minus 2x squared minus another 2x squared equals 0. I'm going to do two steps in one here. Negative 2x squared minus 2x squared gives me minus 4x squared. And I'm also going to subtract to get the negative 2r squared on the other side. We're solving for x, so we divide by negative 4. And now we square root. Now the negative value and the positive value correspond to these two points that I get on the graph, but I only need to know what one of them are. So I'm only going to look at the positive one for now. So I get 1 over root 2r. Okay, let's see if we get another critical point where a prime is undefined. It's going to be undefined where this denominator is 0. So that's going to happen where r squared minus x squared is 0, or r squared is equal to x squared, so r is equal to x. If x were equal to r, then my point would be out here, and I wouldn't have a rectangle anymore because it would have no height. Right? Or, or to see when we, when we plug in, y is going to equal the square root of r squared minus r squared. Okay, So again, the, that length of my rectangle would be 0, and I would have no area. So although that's, that's probably our minimum value, not our maximum. So now let's look at this x equals 1 over root 2r. Instead of finding a y value here, now that I have an x value that is a critical point that I believe is going to maximize the area of the rectangle, what I'm going to do is just plug that right into my area function. So my area is 2 
times 1 over root 2r, r squared minus 1 half r squared to the half power. And we can simplify this a little bit. 2 over root 2 just gives me root 2. r squared minus half of r squared is half of r squared. So we have root 2r times 1 over root 2r. The root 2's cancel, and I just get an area of r squared. So the maximum area is r squared. Okay, next problem. A man launches his boat from point A on the bank of a straight river, three kilometers wide, and wants to reach to point B that's eight kilometers downstream on the opposite bank as quickly as possible. He would row his boat directly across the river to point C. He could row his boat directly across the river to point C and then run to B. So looking at my diagram, we go from A, go straight across, and then come all the way down reach the point B, or he could row directly to point B, or he could row to some point D, then get out of his boat and walk down the river, down the river bank. If he can row six kilometers an hour and run eight kilometers an hour, where should he land in order to reach B as soon as possible? Okay, assuming there's no current, so the rowing speed is his actual speed. So when I look at the question, the part as soon as possible tells me that I want to minimize time. And I can start my equation for time by saying it's going to be the time on water plus the time on land. In order to find the amount of time that he spends on water and on land, I'm going to use formula from physics, distance equals rate times time. Or you might also know this from earlier in, in this class is rate is change in distance over change in time, right? Distance over time. Okay. Either way, I want to solve this for t, so I get that time is equal to distance over rate. So the time on water is going to be the distance that he travels over the water divided by the rate that he goes over the water. So what I need to do is in my diagram, I need to label a distance. The way that I'll set up my diagram is I'll just say that he always goes to the point D and D can move around. So maybe it lines up with C or maybe it lines up with B. And either way, I'll, I'll figure out what's going on. So let's label his distance across the water as X. So then his time on the water is going to be x divided by his rate on the water, which is 6. Then we have his distance on land, which I'll call y. So his time on the land is his distance on the land y divided by his rate on the land 8. So we have an equation that we have built. Now we need a constraint. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the geometry of what I have going on. And I'm going to find a triangle. So if I draw this triangle off to the side and try to label what I know from it, we know that the hypotenuse has been labeled as x, and the river is 3 kilometers wide, so that top leg is 3. Since this whole distance here is 8, and then this shorter piece is y, this piece plus this piece have to equal 8. So y plus our unknown equals 8, so that unknown length is 8 minus y. So I'm going to label this leg of the triangle as 8 minus y. Then I can get a relationship between x and y using the Pythagorean theorem. So x squared equals 3 squared plus 8 minus y squared. If you've been paying close attention and you watched our first video, we did a problem that looks very similar to this. The context was different. Well, there was water involved. I believe it was, it was somebody swimming out to an island. But we end up with a very similar diagram. And what I said in that other one is that if we instead make this other side of the triangle, instead of making it a difference, if we just made it our variable, we end up with a simpler solution. I did that 
in the last video. Here, I'm going to show you what happens if we don't make that observation, and if we just continue along with what seems most intuitive. Okay, so in order to solve for x, I'm going to square root both sides. 3 squared is 9. Let's just go ahead and, and foil out what's going on in the inside and simplify as much as possible as we go. So 8 minus y squared is 8 minus y times 8 minus y, which is 64 minus 8y minus 8y plus y squared. So combining that negative 8y and the negative 8y, we get minus 16y. So x is equal to the square root of y squared minus 16y plus 73. Now I can plug that in for x in my time function. I'm going to rewrite dividing by 6 as multiplying by 1 sixth. So I have 1 sixth times y squared minus 16y plus 73 the half power plus one eighth y. Now we have a function of time in terms of just one variable y. Now we can differentiate. So we're going to be very careful here as we differentiate. The one sixth is a constant multiple, so it's going to hang out. I need to use the chain rule on this next piece. The half comes down. Inside function stays the same. I lower the power by one. Then I multiply by the derivative of the inside function. When I differentiate 1 eighth y, I just get 1 eighth. Now let's finish our derivative. 1 sixth times 1 half will give me 1 twelfth. When I differentiate y squared, I'll get 2y. The derivative of negative 16y is negative 16, and then the derivative of 73 is 0. Let's take one more step to rewrite this. I have my 2y minus 16. I'm going to write in the numerator. 1 12th means I have a 12 in the denominator. And this stuff to a negative power I can write because it's negative in the denominator and because it's a 1 half as a square root. I'm going to keep going with the simplifying here because I'm going to have to do this anyway when I go to solve equations. In the numerator, I can factor out a 2. And if I factor a 2 out of the 12, it will cancel nicely. And then it would be nice to combine these two fractions together, so I need a common denominator. Between 6 and 8, the least common multiple will happen if I multiply the 6 by a 4 and the 8 by a 3. And to get the same denominator, I also have to multiply the 1 8 by the square root. I need to do that in numerator and denominator to avoid changing its value. So now in the numerator, if I distribute my 4, I will have 4y minus 32. We have 24 times the square root of y squared minus 16y plus 73 in the denominator. And on the other side, we have 3 times that same square root in the numerator. Okay. Now let's look for where the derivative is either equal to 0 or the derivative is undefined. So the derivative will be undefined when that denominator is 0. So when 24 times this square root is equal to 0, which will happen when this square root is 0. And if we're a little bit clever, We can come back up here and notice that this square root is just equal to x. So I'm getting a critical point when x is 0, but x is the distance that we go across the water, and it's not possible to go from one side of the river to the other without crossing the water. So that's beyond the scope of our model. That's not a, a real solution. Now we just have to worry about where the derivative is equal to 0, and we have at least a little bit of good news. I have this big fraction equal to 0, and a fraction will be 0 exactly when the numerator is 0. so that at least gets rid of some of the complexity, but I still need to get rid of the square root. The way that we're going to do that is by moving this other stuff to the other side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract 4y and add 32 to both sides. Okay. 
On the right hand side, I'm going to go one step further and factor out a negative 1 because I like my variables to be positive. Now, in order to get rid of the square root, I square both sides. 3 squared is 9. The square root squared will get rid of the square root. Negative 1 squared is 1. And then I have 4y minus 32 squared. So now I'm going to distribute the 9 on the left-hand side. Use your calculator to multiply. Don't do that in your head. On the right-hand side, I'm going to FOIL this out. 16y squared minus... 32 times 4 is 128, and I have a second one of those, and then 32 squared is 1024. Negative squared gives me a positive. Okay, let's group like terms. Track 9y squared on both sides. Add 144y to both sides. Subtract 657 from both sides. What we end up with is a quadratic. I don't believe this quadratic factors, so I'm going to use the quadratic formula. I get two values for y. What I'm going to do is to help me understand where these are and whether they make sense, I'm going to write a decimal approximation for them. So I get that y could either be 11.402 or 4.598. Going back to my diagram, remember that the distance between where we started and where we end going downstream is 8 kilometers. And y could be at most that. If y was more than 8, we would have had to go on back away from our destination and come back. That's clearly not a solution that makes sense. So y has to be somewhere between 0 and 8. At the beginning when we discussed these possibilities, when y is 8, that represents the situation where the rower goes straight across and then runs the full 8 kilometer distance. y being 0 is where the rower goes straight from a to b. And those were possibilities. So when I look at this, we can throw out the 11.402. But both my critical point and the endpoints are legitimate possibilities for, for what could happen. So I have to think about this as finding a, a minimum on a closed interval. So I'm going to look at values for y and time as a function of y. Or y could be 0, or 4.598, or 8. And I'm going to plug in using my equation for time as a function of y. When y is 0, I get 1.424. When y is is 4.598. I get that the time is 1.331. And when y is 8, I get exactly 1.5. So our minimum time does indeed occur at our critical point. So to answer the question, where should he land? That's finding a y value. He should land 4.598 kilometers upstream from point B. Okay, the last question on this sheet looks very similar to one that we've already done. We have this metal can again, and it's a right circular cylinder. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the familiar diagram. I already know what variables to label this with. R, radius R, height H, we're told that the volume of the can is 100 cubic inches. The difference is that in this example, we're told how much the material for the can costs. And the sides and the top and bottom are not all the same. What we want to do, similar to what we had before, is find the cheapest can that we can make that has this given volume. So we want to minimize cost. But cost is not going to be exactly the same as surface area. So let's go ahead and find an equation for cost. So I'm going to have the cost of the top plus the cost of the bottom plus the cost of the side. I'm given that the top and bottom are 5 cents per 
per square inch. So if I take five cents per square inch and I multiply by some number of square inches, then my square inches cancel and I just get cents. So I multiply the area times the cost per unit area to get just the cost. So for the top of the can is five cents times the area. The bottom is five cents per square inch times the number of square inches, right? So the area of the bottom and the side of the can is four cents per square inch times the area of the side. The top of the can has area pi r squared. The bottom of the can has area pi r squared. And because we already did this in this video, I'll just go back and, and look at it. The area of the side of the can is circumference times height, so 2 pi r h. So gathering like terms, 5 pi r squared plus 5 pi r squared gives us 10 pi r squared. And 4 times 2 gives us 8, so we have 8 pi r h. So now we have a function of two variables, r and h, and just like in the previous can problem, the way that we're going to get rid of a variable is we're going to use the constraint, which is volume. The equation for volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h, and we're told that the volume is going to be a fixed 100 cubic inches. So now I have the choice to solve for either r or h, and just like before, solving for r involves a square root. I'd rather not, so we're going to solve for h. So h is 100 over pi r squared, and we're going to plug that in for h in our cost function. So I replace the h with 100 over pi r squared. Do some simplifying. The pi's will cancel. This r will cancel with one of my r's in the denominator. And I'm going to rewrite this function so that it's more friendly to differentiate. The 8 times 100 will give me 800, and dividing by r I can write as an r to the negative 1 power. Now we differentiate. So c prime is going to be 10 pi times 2r plus 800 times negative r to the negative 2. Let's rewrite that so that I don't have a negative exponent. And now we look for where is the derivative 0 or undefined. It's going to be undefined when r is 0, because that's my denominator. But when r is 0, we have no can, so this is not a real solution. When c prime is equal to 0, we will have 20 pi r minus 800 over r squared equal to 0 and I'm going to multiply through by r squared to get rid of the fractions. So we have 20 pi r cubed minus 800 equals 0. Add 800 to both sides. So we have 20 pi r cubed equals 800. Divide by 20 pi. So r cubed is 40 over pi. When I cube root, I will get r is the cubed root of 40 over pi, which is approximately 2.335. And remember, our units here are inches. Let's go back and look at our question. We want to find the cost of the cheapest can. We found this one critical point that we're pretty confident is going to give us our, our minimum cost, 2.335. I'm going to go back and I'm going to plug that into our cost function. So cost with 2.335 plugged in will give me 513.899. Remember this is in cents. I'm going to round to the nearest whole cent. So that's equal to in dollars, five dollars and fourteen cents. That's the cheapest can. That's pretty pricey. I think that our our materials costs are a little high here.